Hi, good evening. My colleagues uh, in, uh, from India, Pakistan, also in our region, as well as some friends and colleagues in Hong Kong, as well as uh, probably also from other parts of the world. Uh, I, I would like to uh, introduce myself. I'm Grace Wong from Hong Kong, from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I'm truly honored to be the moderator today because uh, this evening we have three distinguished, uh, wonderful speakers who are experts in the field to share with you a very interesting important hot topic would be the uh, liver and gem manifestation of COVID-19. We're still a um, very big issue around the world, still uh, having new cases and causing a lot of deaths uh, every day. So this evening, we are going to learn a lot from these three speakers. So I would first like to introduce uh, all three speakers first, and then uh, we will listen to their wonderful presentations. So first, I would like to introduce Professor Anil Aurora. He's the chairman of the Institute of Liver Gastroenterology and uh, Pan Pancreatic Biliary Sciences, uh, Ganga Ram Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research of Seringana Ram Hospital, New Delhi. Our second speaker will be uh, Professor Asanji K. As Satipati uh, from uh, New York. Um, he's uh, currently an associate professor of medicine at the Donald and Barbara Sucker School of Medicine uh, at the Hofstra University and serving as the medical director of liver transplantation at the North Shore uh, University Hospital and Northwell ha uh, Health uh, USA. Just now we have a brief chat and uh, Professor Asan Papi and uh, said that he's now in the really the core of the core of the uh, back hit uh, COVID uh, in New York. And uh, the third speaker would be uh, Professor Robert Gish. Uh, professor Gish is an adjunct professor of medicine at the University of Nevada School of Medicine in Las Vegas, a clinical professor at the University of Nevada Rano School of Medicine, and a clinical professor at the University of California South School of uh, Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. In addition, he is also the medical director of the Habitat B Foundation and and a medical director of the Asian Pacific Health Foundations. So with these three distinguished uh, speakers and experts, uh, I'm sure that we are going to learn a lot from them. So first, may I uh, invite Professor Andrew Aurora to uh, deliver his talk. Professor uh, Aurora, please. It's a pleasure being with you. There are 5,000 different species of coronavirus infection which have been identified the world over, of which at least 500 have been identified in different varieties of bats in China. In the last two decades, two distinct episodes of the coronaviruses have been known to the humankind. First of, the, of them was in 2002, and this was called a sars cov virus infection, in which we had a definite civet cat as an intermediary host, followed by infection into the human beings. And then in 2019, another coronavirus infection traveled into the human beings via these camels and this was origin this disease originated in middle east and hence it was referred to as a middle east respiratory distress syndrome caused by coronavirus infection we know that this coronavirus infection tends to migrate from the animals with or without an intermediate host into the human beings and as a general principles of genetic diversity it is very well known that the moment the virus tends to jump the species it tends to be more virulent and that is how the story of the covid 19 unfolds in indian in the world scenario the first case was reported in wuhan and was confirmed to be because of a new virus infection which chinese authorities had named as novel coronavirus infection on 10th of january Subsequently, there have been explosion of the cases and on 11th February, International Committee for Taxonomy of the Viruses named this virus of COVID-19 disease as SARS-CoV-2 infection. And by 11th March, WHO had no option because of the explosion of the cases that it was forced to declare the infection as a pandemic. Why is it that on evening of this weekend we are discussing this COVID-19 infection. How is it that it is different from COVID-1 or SARS-CoV infection? There are three major differences between the two viruses. 
first of all in the first infection which started in china in 2002 we had a definitive host which is it was in the form of civet cats so if you cull these cats you break the chain and hence the disease was limited to only 2 8000 people all over the world whereas in covid 19 we still do not know the reservoir there are enough number of asymptomatic people who keep spreading the disease and hence till date there have been ever increasing number of the patients which we are not not been able to control till now second difference between the two was that all those who were infected they were hospitalized and you had a limited barrier nursing that means all sick patient you admit them you implement barrier nursing and you are able to control the disease whereas in covid 19 infection we know there is a widespread community infection with a total population of the world surpassing 7 billion it's very difficult to control the infection which is traveling like wildfire across the community third difference between the two viruses infection is that the disease will not be transmitted in first covid infection if the patient is not symptomatic that means you have to have fever and symptoms and it is only after that the disease will transmissible whereas in covid 19 the present menace of covid you have lot of asymptomatic and pre symptomatic patients who are giving the virus a major thirst to go up and up so this is what happened and the result is for all of us to see by today 2 hours from now we had 3.94 million cases of the covid 19 infection all over the world with 2017 5000 patients dying of the illness the basic difference between the first two epidemic and the present epidemic is that even though it is less virulent but it is more infective that is the reason the number has gone up fortunately for us fortunately for our patient the overall mortality is 3% as compared to infectivity and uh, mortality of 30% in ebola virus infection coronavirus 2 infection or cov to sars cov 2 infection which i'll be referring to as covid 19 which is a disease is transmitted by this in, uh, virus which is 125 nanometer in diameter made up of a 30 kilobyte base of a positive stranded single stranded rna it has an envelope and it has a multiple spiky proteins at the edges these spiky proteins give it an appearance of something called crown and hence it is called a coronavirus infection this designation of coronavirus was impounded to this as long back in 1958 in china itself the, this is an important component called s protein or the spike protein which is important because of its ability to attach to the host cell and enter into the host host uh, cell at different places in the human body so this is a coronavirus infection and this sars cov 1 and 2 will attach to the angiotensin converters 2 enzyme 2 receptor which will activate and will get activated by another protease called tmpr ss2 so with this combination of the two the virus is internalized being an enveloped virus it cannot go across the cell membrane and has to be endocytized as the virus is endocytized it tends to fuse with this organelle within the cell which is called an endosome endosome is basically made up of acidic stuff and once there is a fusion of the virus with this endosome there is a complete lysis of the virion so that means envelope is broken down the various spike m and e protein of the viruses are segregated and the naked rna comes out into the cytoplasm for replication onto the already preformed machinery of the ribosomal rna within the cell so the virus is utilizing the whole inbuilt machinery of the host cell to replicate both the structural and non structural component of the virus they keep on uh helping the system in multiplication of the structural as well as the non structural component of the virus and it, this is the time when the host intracellular machinery shuts down and it basically looks after the virus as if the virus the cell has nothing else to do but help the virus grow so this is what happens the virus is coming into the cell you have a positive stranded rna that rna then produces a complementary strand of negative stranded rna which leads to production of rna polymerase so both positive and negative strands they get translated onto the ribosomes within the human host cell leading to production of structural as well as a non structural component of the virus which are that extruded into the cell so this is the time when the virus is entering 
host host cell is doing every bit of help to let the virus multiply at its own sweet pace otherwise in a normal course of the events if the virus enters into the cell this rna of the virus or double stranded rna of the virus is picked up by the intracytoplasmic sensors which may lie within the cytoplasm they may lie on to the endosomes or they may lie into the mitochondria so this foreign agent ideally should be picked up by the intracytoplasmic as well as endosomal sensors that should lead to production of inflammatory cytokines through the production through the stimulation of nf kappa b stimulation which produces interferon this interferon which is produced by the host cell because of the incoming virus tends, tends to go into the next cell in an autocrine or paracrine fashion and that's this through this interferon receptors that lead to production of interferon stimulating genes so once the single cell is infected with virus it tends to send a signal to the surrounding cell through an interferon so that the other cell does not get infected this is the normal phenomena see at the same time once you have a virus which has been picked up by this first immune defense mechanism that is in the form of monocytes and macrophages through the through this pattern recognition patterns both which are both cytoplasmic as well as membranous all these pathogen associated molecular pattern are picked up by the antigen processing cells which lead to production of significant inflammatory response cells which lead to destruction of the incoming pathogen as well as acquisition of the acquired immunity so two mechanisms tend to come into play once you have a virus which is entering the cell but this is what this virus is doing to us after entering into the cell it keeps on multiplying onto the intra cytoplasmic rna machinery and then it has a habit of hiding in the double membrane vesicle that means virus continues to multiply within the cell and cell is not even aware of it that it is multiplying so it is able to it, it is able to hide itself from the defensive mechanism the intracellular component of the cell and keeps on multiplying at a rapid pace so this is one mechanism of the uh, evasion of the immune response by the virus another thing this virus is doing is that at different levels within the cell it suppresses and tries to suppress the inflammatory response and stimulation of the nf kappa b stimulus by suppressing the anti sensor mechanism at different levels that when it neutralizes the cytoplas cytoplasmic rna sensors it prevents the formation of the nf kappa b stimulus as well as it blocks the entry of the interferon through the interferon receptor which will produce interferon stimulating gene so by multi acting at multiple places this virus is trying to immune uh, evade the immune system and keeps on multiplying at its own sweet pace so once the virus is multiplying and it comes after multiplication it comes out into the extracellular space in terms of formation of large number of the virions now what happens is that adaptive immunity has to come into play both cd4 and cd8 cells have to come into play cd8 cells should kill the virus whereas the helper ct cells should produce immune response but what is happening is in covid 19 infection is there is a delayed immune interferon response which is giving virus a good window to multiply and that is what results in long incubation period now it is the responsibility of the adaptive immune response because the first response of interferon has been failed by the covid virus infection let's see what happens in the lungs as the virus enters into the alveoli the type 2 alveoli has the highest concentration of ace2 receptors as the virus enters into the uh, alveoli the type 2 type of alveoli it suppresses the formation of the interferon that means first immune reaction or immune defense system is paralyzed so large number of the virions are produced which lead to recruitment of lot of macrophages monocytes and neutrophils these activated lymphocytes somehow fail to produce cytotoxic t cells so that means virus is not killed in addition it keeps on producing lot of pro inflammatory cytokines which lead to destruction of the virus so there are two major problems in covid virus infection as against the ordinary influenza virus infection in the first stage you let the virus multiply at its own sweet pace and as the virus is getting settled down it depends on the response of the body if the body is mounting a very small inconspicuous insignificant immune response then you can go scot free you have a mild disease 
but in case there is a dis dysregulated exaggerated immune response you are likely to come down with all, all the complications of respiratory distress syndrome which may ultimately turn out to be fatal in a situation like this so what kills the patients and the human beings in covid 19 infection is the host immunity which is responsible for the severity of the symptoms so these are the three scenarios which can occur once the virus into the cell one is you and you mount an early interferon response as happens in a common cold or a typical influenza infection so that the disease gets under control there could be another scenario in which the first interferon response is delayed and you have a delayed interferon response and as the delayed interferon response lets the virus multiply you have an exaggerated exaggerated immune response from the cd4 cells which leads to acute respiratory distress syndrome third scenario may be in a condition in which there is no interferon response even before or in the delayed phase and hence you have no symptom so this is the problem in covid virus disease that you have a delayed interferon response followed by exaggerated immune response by the affected cells so in covid virus infection so if you have a simple first phase immune response you have limited inflammatory response you are able to get rid of the virus your immune system takes care of the virus you get a protective immunity immunity and you go scot free but at time when you do not have an initial interferon response which gets delayed the secondary inflammatory response because of the pro inflammatory cells like activated t cells lead to disregulated exaggerated pro inflammatory cytokine kin malleu which leads to development of acute liver injury and acute respiratory distress syndrome which is the cause of the mortality so this is what we typically see depending upon whether you mount a interferon response or you do not mount an interferon response in the initial phase you may have mild moderate or symptoms which may be different so is the pathogenesis important in understanding the basis of the treatment let's see can be pathologically block this receptor what happens so theoretically as i said if you are able to block as2 receptor or tmpsr ss2 blockers you may prevent the entry of the virus into the cell and can you can get rid of the disease but problem is there is a controversy regarding the role of as2 receptors uh, inhibition in control of covid 19 infection as of now the current literature says that blocking them alone may not be sufficient there is some there are some studies which tend to tell us that if you neutralize the incoming attachment of the co virus infection onto the as receptors by giving soluble as2 receptors within the circulation there may be of some advantage of blocking it it is also possible to block this attachment of tmps rss2 with the virus by using this agent which dr uh, gish will tell us whether it is of any use or not you can at the same time as the virus is multiplying in the cell you can try to block the multiplication of the virus with these antiviral drugs which will be coming to soon and finally you have a drug called chloroquine which is a twin mechanism of action by default it is a weak base and once it enters into the cytoplasm of the host cell it tends to neutralize the lysosomal acidity and hence tries to su suppress the release of the virion from the lysosome into the circulation as most of the enzymatic reaction within the cell are ph dependent and when there is a lot of acid which is released into the cytoplasm so a so in chloroquine acts at multiple levels in suppressing the virus within the cell so it has an antiviral action secondly it is the only immunomodulatory drug which is used in rheumatoid arthritis at its as it suppresses the release of interferon and hence it decreases the interferon mediated increasing pro inflammatory milieu within the cell so it has an anti inflammatory action so based on these two there is some suggestion that hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine may have some utility in patient with covid 19 infection i did talk of pro inflammatory cytokines which can affect the uh, pathology in lungs and these are the various drug which are being used and dr gish will tell us in detail whether, whether they are of any use to us or not immune targeted therapy is extremely important if you we understand the phase of the viral illness which which the patient comes to us in the first phase when the virus is small in amount you have some inflammatory response as the virus amount is increasing in the body you have limited inflammation but once the virus is this decreasing inflammation is going up this is the time when you need to intervene with immunosuppressive drugs so if you can pick up the patient at this stage you can use a combination of IV IG as well as low molecular weight heparin 
And finally, if you have to think of vaccine, uh, the only way of doing a vaccination in COVID-19 infection is by knowing the pathobiology of the virus. And this is the elegant study published from Singapore, which clearly shows that the maximum concentration of the virion of the COVID-19, they tend to occur in the nasal, mucosal, basal cells, which have a highest concentration. These secretory goblet cells within the nasal mucosa have the highest concentration of the uh, uh, COVID virus infection. So tomorrow, if you have to develop a vaccine, the best way is to use the intranasal route. So to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, these are the different phases pathologically of the viral infection. In the early phase, you have a lot of virus, which is multiplying patient is asymptomatic. If you mount an immune response, you go scot free. If you have exaggerated immune response, you can land up in complication. And the type of therapy certainly can be guided up at what stage the patient enters to you. So to sum up, there are different stages of COVID virus infection. In the first stage, you, have, you are having asymptomatic disease in the virus has just entered the body. The virus keeps multiplying within the cell, not producing any symptoms as the initial interferon response is delayed. And because of the lack of the initial response, you have a large number of the virus which comes into the extracellular region. And this is the time when exaggerated dysregulated immune system mounts an exaggerated response leading to ARDS and mortality. And this, if we have a knowledge of this pathogenesis, we can have the basis of intervention, both for antiviral drugs as well as for vaccination. With that, I'll pass on the baton back to Dr. Wong. Now, may I invite speakers, uh, Professor uh, Sanjay. Uh, he is going to uh, have more uh, description about the liver and GI manifestation of COVID-19. Uh, Professor Sanja, please. Colleagues from the United States and listening to those from, those from India and Hong Kong. Uh, my slides, please. So I've been assigned to talk on liver and GI manifestations of COVID-19. Um, I have no actual or potential conflict of interest uh, in relation to this program or presentation. So to begin, I would like to uh, give a summary of the timeline. As we all know, the first case of the coronavirus, severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, coronavirus 2, was uh, reported from the Wuhan, Hubei province of China. Then the first case was detected in USA in, from the Washington state in, uh, in January 21st. And since that, you can see there is an exponential increase in the number of cases that was reported across the world. WHO declared this as a global public health, public health emergency in January 30th. And then WHO designated this as a COVID-19 disease in February 11, 2020. And as you know, from there on, we have moved on to the point that now we have more than near close to 4 million cases across the world. USA tops the list followed by Spain and Italy. This disease or COVID-19 disease has a multi-organ um, implications. It has immunologic effect that causes fever secondary to cytokine release syndrome. It causes gastrointestinal manifestation, which we'll be focusing on today. Uh, number of dermatological manifestations and the primary response is, of course, the respiratory illness and also has been shown to cause cardiovascular manifestation, hematologic manifestation. Again, this is so important. So many patients, almost, you know, to the uh, almost of the tune of almost 50 percent patients develop thrombolic complications. And this is such an important thing that now is a focus of uh, discussion focus of um, treatment as well, especially to prevent uh, mortality. Many centers have started adopting um, preventive strategies for thromboembolism as well. Now, we're going to talk about COVID-19 and liver disease to begin with, and then we'll talk about the GI manifestation. Now, a few questions I would like to put it at the beginning. This was raised by ESO. Um, um, uh, their consensus uh, statement. It remains unclear at this time whether liver test alterations are a sign for 
pre-existing liver disease in patients with a more severe course of infections, or whether they rather reflect liver damage caused by the virus itself, or whether they mirror a severe inflammatory response. And finally, whether having an acute liver injury related to COVID-19 portends to a poor prognosis. So this, let's focus on the first question, whether liver test alterations are a sign of pre-existing liver diseases in patients with a more severe course of infections, okay? Now, let us see the summary of some of the studies that has been reported so far. I think there are many studies that have already come up after this slide when I summarized it. But what you see, the, the number of patients reported to have an underlying pre-existing liver disease is small. Uh, almost uh, we reported 2% to, to the tune of 11% has been reported, depending on the number of patients they have reported. So uh, even the largest study that we reported uh, from Northwell, 5,700, they reported 0.5% of patients had a, um, a, a pre-existing liver disease. Well, it also all biased by the, uh, you know, with a rigor, rigor, they have looked into the underlying chronic liver disease because uh, many of them use the diagnostic codes versus another stuff. Uh, but essentially what we see that pre-existing liver disease uh, doesn't really play as much of a role, uh, although the severity and outcomes may need to determine in terms of their liver test abnormalities because the percentage of patients having liver test abnormalities is very high. So let's look at this. Uh, this was the publication, one of the largest uh, uh, series uh, from Northwell, where I am um, a medical director for the liver transplant program there. So here we have 5,700 patients that was reported in the New England Journal, uh, in the JAMA recently. And what you see that AST more than 40 has been reported to the tune of 58.4% of patients and ALT more than 60, uh, 39%. So there is a vast uh, major number of patients uh, who present with uh, abnormal liver tests in, in these populations. And depending on the definition, what is the upper number, upper normal using this number could vary as well. Now question is, does having an underlying liver disease like chronic viral hepatitis increase the risk of the COVID-19? Now this study from China, 1,099 patients, what they have found hepatitis B, which is quite common in those areas, 23 patients had been reported to have chronic hepatitis B. They, when they categorized patients by the severity of illness, non-severe versus severe, they didn't find any difference in terms of their uh, um, distribution of the number of patients with uh, hepatitis B. So, so, so it's been, it's at least at this point, we don't know, or we at least we can say uh, based on these studies that uh, hepatitis, having underlying hepatitis B does not affect the severity of their outcomes. Now, whether having underlying uh, NAFOLD or NAS uh, potentially uh, uh, puts the patients at increased risk of severe clinical course. Now, what do we know from this study from Northwell uh, uh, that the, the common comorbidities in patients with COVID-19 are hypertension in 56%, obesity in 42%, and diabetes in almost 34%. So hypertension, obesity, diabetes are quite common in patients who uh, presents to the hospital with symptoms. And uh, these are the distribution of the, uh, the common comorbidities when they're hospitalized. And this was similarly reflected in another study from New York from Cornell, almost uh, similar numbers. So what we learned from this, now we know that these comorbidities are common in patients who present to the hospital with COVID-19. Again, these are also common comorbidities in NAFOL patients. So whether NAFOL patients are at increased risk of having a severe cl clinical course or is it the comorbidities uh, in NAFLD affects their outcome yet to be determined. Well, one study from China attempted to uh, specifically look patient population from NAFLD, and this study included 202 patients. And what they have found, patients with NAFLD had a higher risk of disease progression, 44.7% uh, versus 6%. Higher likelihood of abnormal liver function from admission to discharge, 70% versus 11%, and a longer viral setting time compared to patients with, without NAFLD. So certainly this does say that potentially patients with NAFLD would have a, a worse outcome and, uh, and, 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 uh, and this needs to be determined maybe in the larger studies and we need to look for more uh, studies, uh, especially to confirm these findings. Now, there is another study very interesting uh, that, we, that uh, came from China as well. Uh, they reported a pool data from about nine uh, provinces and what they have shown that patients when they present 
the duration of symptoms also matters with regards to the liver injury. If the patient have a longer duration of symptoms, they're more likely to have uh, uh, increased liver injury. Uh, once they're hospitalized, however, if you look at the figure D, there is no difference in terms of the uh, uh, hepatic injury um, um, uh, once they're hospitalized. So liver injury versus without liver injury, there is no difference um, uh, when, uh, based on the hospital states. Now, the next uh, question is, uh, uh, what is the pattern of liver injury in these patients? Now, first thing, if you look at this is a study coming from, again, China, 400, 400, 417 patients, and they found abnormal liver function. Um, if you look at the top part, total number of patients, 76% has abnormal liver function test, 21%, 21% has uh, liver injury among, uh, from those uh, numbers. Now, when they divide these groups into severe versus non-severe illness, uh, again, patients with a severe illness, they're more likely to have liver injury, 46%, as compared to non-severe illness, 14%. So patients with more severe illness uh, uh, presenting to the hospital are more likely to have a, a, a more severe liver injury. Again, whether it is a reflection of their liver injury uh, or is a, a reflection of the cytokine storm, these are things that we need to answer down the road. Now, this is the pattern of liver injury from the same study they have reported. Now, they've, they've basically classified the injury into hepatocellular, cholestatic, and mixed. And as you can see, the injury patterns, uh, the, uh, the injury pattern most common is the mixed type. Um, and cholestatic patterns has been reported um, in about 29%, and hepatocellular patient about 20 The similar, page, similar numbers of hepatocellular and cholestatic patterns. This is based on the study from, the, from the China. Now, next question, whether liver injury rather reflect liver damage caused by the virus itself. Again, let's look at the evidence that might cause this. Uh, so mechanism of cell entry, if you look at Dr. Arora given him, uh, explained it very, um, very well in, in his presentation that the, the SARS coronavirus, uh, which is a spike protein, uh, requires an activation by the TMPRSS2, and then it's attached to the angiotensin converting enzyme. A receptor for the internalization into the into the cell. So the virus entry is through the ACE2 receptor, but the ACE2 receptor has been shown from the two data from two independent cohorts. They verified that there is significant enrichment of the ACE2 expression in the cholangiocytes as compared to hepatocytes. So, so SARS coronavirus uh, two might directly bind the uh, ACE2 positive cholangiocytes to dysregulate liver function. This is a speculation. Uh, although this speculation is, is possible, but what we have not seen that ACE2 is, even if highly expressed in the doc cell, 54% um, uh, of the COVID-19 patients, whereas only 1.8% of the patients had elevated ALP level. So GGT elevation is 54%, uh, whereas only 1.8% patient had elevated ALP levels. I would expect the cholangiocyte, if it's the source of an entry and inflammation, could be we could we would expect a much higher level of ALP, which we don't see. So there may be other mechanism um, uh, for the viral uh, injury uh, um, of, the, of the liver. So let us look at some of the evidence so far. Does really uh, is 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 this speculation is possible that there is a direct viral cytopathic effect or not, or is this a bystander effect now? Now, question: This is a patient which we uh, reported from our own center. Uh, uh, my division chief, Dr. David Bernstein, reported it in American Journal of Gastroenterology. This is a 59-year-old female who presented to the emergency department with primary complaint of, you know, dark urine. There was no respiratory symptoms. The patient had HIV infection, well controlled, and uh, her liver chemistries were normal uh, uh, prior to the admission. And she presented with a significantly elevated liver test. As you can see, bilirubin was not elevated 0.6, but the AST was to a 1230, ALT was 697, and alkaline phosphate is minimally elevated. Uh, this patient, uh, the rest of the workup for uh, acute liver injury were unremarkable. Um, and, and, and what we have seen, this patient developed respiratory symptoms after the liver injury. The liver injuries already happened. The patient already presenting with a very high ASTLT, didn't have any respiratory symptoms and admission, but on the day two started developing respiratory symptoms. At that point, we started uh, thinking that this patient possibly may have coronavirus infection. It was just uh, unsuspected, but we just wanted to rule that out and the patient had uh, came out to be uh, positive for uh, coronavirus. 
So this patient was, uh, that time was treated with a five day course of hydroxychloroquine and CD12 was discharged home with improvement in her liver test. So this raised the possibility that that is a potential for a viral direct cytopathic effect of the virus. Uh, at that point, um, uh, um, and this patient, uh, this was reported, and you can see the clinical course of this patient in the hospital from day one through day seven, uh, significant elevated ASTLT level, and, and then improved uh, over the course of the uh, a few days after uh, the respiratory symptoms improved. I would like to present another case, which we just uh, published, is online already, in the Liver International. Uh, this is a 56-year-old woman uh, who had a decompensated alcoholic cirrhosis, uh, who had um, gastric varicell bleed uh, a few months ago um, and, uh, and, and basically presented uh, with abdominal pain, fever, diarrhea. Uh, she was abstinent from alcohol for about three months already. Her alcohol level was negative on a hospital admission. She was hypertensive uh, and, uh, and was saturating. Her respiratory status was fine. She was saturating 97% room air when she was presented to the hospital. She was resuscitated with the improvement in her uh, volume status, and she was noted to have an INR of 1.9, bilirubin 9.4, and ALP 128, AST 184, and ALT 94 a few days prior to the admission. So this is the baseline. So this patient at that time was not qualifying an acute and chronic liver failure. She had a stable, although decompensated liver disease. Now with the coronavirus infection, this patient actually presented with the symptoms and we worked her up and she was found to have positive for coronavirus. And her white cell count on admission again, 14.5 thousand. And her total bilirubin was 14.5, went up from 9 point uh, something, 9.5 before. Direct bilirubin was more than 10. Her AST was 741, uh, ALT was 241, and uh, alkaline phosphate is 158. So this patient um, uh, fit into the diagnosis of acute and chronic liver failure. She was uh, managed conservatively. Our, our, our imaging study did not show significant respiratory disease. She had a mild uh, infiltrate in the left uh, uh, lower lobe with possible small pleural effusion, but really um, she was asymptom. Uh, uh, she was not requiring a lot of oxygen. Uh, so she did fit into the diagnosis of ACLF uh, grade two and was managed uh, conservatively with improvement uh, of, her sim of her symptoms and was discharged on day seven. So this is the trend of the liver chemistries in this patient. So what we learned from this case is that patients who already have a decompensated liver disease and who develops um, a SARS coronavirus infection are at risk of having uh, acute uh, worsening of their uh, liver decompensation or liver failure. Um, uh, and, and we need to monitor these patients very closely in those situations. Now, whether elevated liver enzymes mirror a severe inflammatory response this is a study that we are we have uh, um, uh, we sent for publications under review right now. But what we found this is a this is actually this all these studies pulled together from uh, China, uh, and what we have found the patients with a severe illness are more likely to have uh, higher uh, liver injury as compared to non-severe illness. What is the mechanism of liver injury so far? We learned so we know uh, these are all speculations. So number one uh, speculation is that potentially this is a bystander hepatitis. It's an effect from the cytokine storm, uh, which is uh, common in many viral illnesses as well. And this is, there, there is a hyper inflammatory response in patients with SARS coronavirus infection, uh, and that potentially can cause uh, a liver injury because of this uh, uh, cytokine storm. The other uh, mechanism we thought, talked about is a potential direct cytopathic effect. Again, needs to be proved. And the other mechan the few other mechanisms we need to be cognizant of is that patients, these are patients who are coming with respiratory illness. Uh, they may potentially have uh, severe hypoxia. And hypoxia, we know that can cause ischemic liver injury from hypoxic hepatitis. Again, many drugs these patients are on. Even the treatment that we are using, uh, uh, using to treat this patient, lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, in many, many countries under clinical trials, and, and some of these drugs has shown potential uh, liver injuries as well. So we need to be cognizant of their side effect profile uh, and many of the drugs, drug-drug uh, interaction that is that might occur in these patients, we need to be cognizant of those facts as well for causing the liver injury. Now, having liver disease and liver dysfunction in patients with SARS coronavirus infection, um, uh, how, how, how this has been reported across uh, different studies, what you have seen, what you can see from 
uh, from the reported studies that uh, you know the there is a predominance of AST elevation as compared to ALT. And I would not go through the details of this each individual studies, but what to highlight from this is that uh, potentially there is a pattern of injury that uh, may signal that patient may have uh, the liver injuries that may be related to the SARS coronavirus infection. My uh, general rule that I follow um, uh, based on uh, my experience, this is not a guideline, uh, but this is what I would uh, I have gathered from uh, the studies that has been published so far and based on my experience. So if patient has a, a, a COVID-19 and has elevated liver chemistries, I look uh, their AST, ALT, bilirubin, and alkaline phosphatase level. Now, if the AST is more than ALT and the bilirubin is less than five times and alkaline phosphatase is usually less than two times and they have a high ferritin D-dimer, procalcitonin, CRP, and LDH uh, that I will consider the cytokine storm, I'll suspect this is potentially related to SARS-CoV-19 related. And, and most of these patients will recover as the with the improvement of their coronavirus infection. I really don't need to investigate too much of other, the other etiologies, but I would very careful, especially if they have underlying liver disease, especially cirrhosis, and monitor for an acute and chronic liver failure. If there is no cirrhosis, I would potentially uh, expect a natural recovery with improvement of their COVID-19 related illness. The other uh, group, which is if the ALT is more than AST and alkaline phosphate is significantly elevated, if the bilirubin is uh, uh, more than five, I would consider potentially maybe this is not COVID-19 related. It may be, we may need to investigate further to rule out non-COVID-19 related liver test abnormalities. And if there is cirrhosis, of course, we need to monitor for acute and chronic liver failure. Again, this is um, this is my observations and we need to uh, uh, get more studies uh, because there are studies that are very scarce, uh, scarce, uh, scarce at this time to make a definitive argument what is right or wrong. But this is the general observations that I would like to say. Now I would like to focus my talk to the GI manifestations. Uh, there's a study from Wuhan, uh, a retrospective review of 11,041 cases admitted to the to a single hospital over an approximately seven week period, 16% presented with the gastrointestinal symptoms only. Um, um, another study uh, from, uh, again, a cross-sectional descriptive study, 204 patients, this from Hubei province, uh, they found 48.5% had gastrointestinal symptoms. Anorexia, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain were the predominant symptoms in these patients. Um, GI symptoms and severity of COVID-19, when you looked into it, 651 patients, 11% presented with at least one GI symptoms, that is nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, and 10.8% had pre-existing liver disease in these patients. Of these patients with COVID-19 with GI symptoms, 23% had severe critical illness compared to 8.1% without GI symptoms. So I think there's something speaking about whether the symptoms of uh, the GI symptoms portend to a more severe illness. I think this study kind of speak about it. Okay. Again, these are all speculation. Uh, these are all ob observations and, and we need to Get, get more studies, more data about how to explain, how, how to interpret when somebody has a GI symptoms and how their outcomes would be. Now, this is a study from uh, USA. Uh, Cholankaril, uh, Cholankaril, uh, George Cholankaril, who is from Stanford, 116 patients. Um, nausea vomiting was 10.3%, uh, diarrhea was 10.3%, nausea vomiting and diarrhea, three uh, symptoms are 4.3%. Uh, abdominal pain was 8.8% and the loss of appetite is 25%. So again, across the board, these are uh, uh, reported uh, GI symptoms. Uh, and this has been summarized recently by AGA in a rapid review in a meta-analysis just published in gastroenterology. This pretty much summarizes all these studies with the GI, sim, GI and liver manifestation so far. So what, uh, I think this is a summary slide, I think will give the message about uh, what is going on with the with the GI symptoms in a patient with COVID-19 disease. So if you look at the diarrhea in all patients, 7.7%. Nausea vomiting is 7.8%. Abdominal pain, 3.6%. So this is the more common. So, so it's this, and when you compare patients from China versus those studies reported from other countries, these other countries aside from China report GI symptoms more commonly than from the, those studies from the China. These studies also report elevated AST and ALT, 15% only. This is a full, full report. So again, as we said, as, as I said, the largest study from here almost reported more than 50% patient having LFT abnormalities. Now, one other thing I want to highlight, the study from 
uh, Colombia um, um, from the study from the New York, uh, what they have reported is that patients with the GI symptoms, uh, particularly, uh, are more likely to be COVID positive, especially uh, when you are the pretest probability is much higher. Uh, they're more likely, and and patients uh, with COVID-19, the presence of GI symptoms was associated with a longer illness duration and the lower rate of death among short term uh, on the short term follow. So maybe GI symptoms actually, in uh, somehow modulates uh, their presentations that their outcomes are better as compared to those who don't have don't have GI symptoms. I think that's all uh, to share um, from my side, and thank you very much for your attention. As well as your personal experience is really wonderful. Really, I have because the data are still evolving, a lot of literature. So I really want to thank you a lot. Now I would like to invite our third speaker, Professor Robert Hill. Uh, he is going to share a topic: current treatment and future direction in COVID nineteen. Uh, Professor Kish, please. Thank you, Grace. Great to be working with Anil and Sanjaya again. Greetings to all attendees in Hong Kong and regionally and worldwide. I would like to highlight that this is a short presentation, but there's a full presentation on my website, robertgish.com. So I'd point you there if you'd like to download this slide deck, and I think it'll be available through this website as well. I'll make sure the full uh, deck is posted. There's a huge amount of information. What I would like to do is cover what I think are very promising uh, therapies. I'd like to take away some of the fake news about medications that aren't working or there's little evidence and may be dangerous, and then give some ideas about future directions. Have no relevant disclosures. Everybody understands how serious COVID-19 is. This is data in the U.S. where COVID-19 uh, went to basically parallel deaths from heart disease in the top two causes of death in our countries. This is between April 6th and April 12th. This is really highlighting how serious this disease is for society, for individuals, for our medical and patient community. You've already seen this beautiful slide from Dr. Aurora. I like to point down to the bottom, we're going to be talking about potential or possibly proven therapies and also uh, focusing on anti-inflammatories. One thing I'm not going to cover other than just a brief mention is those patients who are immune suppressed, uh, transplant patients, uh, uh, other types of medications that are being used for immune suppression and autoimmune diseases. In general, we are not reducing immune suppression unless they have more moderate <clears throat> or severe disease. The time to treat, of course, would be an asymptomatic. This is a slide that I borrowed from Dr. Aurora, but we don't have ways of testing and proving asymptomatic disease and linking to care yet. But at some time point in the near future, we may actually be treating patient in this asymptomatic or low symptomatic phase like we do with Tamiflu and, and influenza. There is a global trial that's going on called the Solidarity Trial that includes hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir, and interferon beta. At one time, there was an arm with lopinavir and ritonavir, but lopinavir and ritonavir as a dual agent has not been proven to be effective, although there was an interesting news release about lopinavir, ritonavir, and um, using that with a tripla showing some benefit, but I'm not gonna discuss that in great detail until that's published in the peer-reviewed uh, literature. One thing I'd like to highlight is this uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, induces a hypercoagulable state that is the reason for uh, a majority of the pulmonary disease, a substantial amount of the cardiac disease, may also even relate to what's happening in the liver with elevated liver enzymes and in a subset of patients' abnormal function. This hypercoagulable state may be treated by using uh, anticoagulant low molecular weight heparin. These, these, uh, so anticoagulation is being studied and should only be used in a controlled setting or in a research setting, but people should be looking to this, especially in the hospital or ICU setting. We've already seen this slide from Dr. Aurora, but the bad news is we don't have any data yet from any medication that blocking receptor uptake is going to help with this disease, but it is a, a target of uh, considerable research. 
Uh, initially, people were stopping ARBs and ACE2 inhibitors, thinking that they might have made the disease worse. There may be a slight survival advantage, uh, contrarily, to keeping patients on these medications unless they're hypotensive. So right now, just do your best management with these medicines, but don't stop them necessarily because the patient has tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. This is a uh, molecular and cellular map of what happens with uptake. We talked briefly with Dr. Aurora's presentation about campostate um, as an uptake inhibitor. Clinical trials are ongoing for that uh, medication, but we don't have any substantial proof. It only, should only be used in clinical trials. Arbidol is another medication that's antiviral that's in research also right now, alone and in combination with Haldaprevir. Um, may also be proven, but we need uh, further data from clinical trials. I'm gonna warn people away from using chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine unless it's in a clinical trial and in an inpatient monitored setting with close cardiac monitoring. There has been some studies that have shown an increased mortality rate, especially if used with azithromycin, probably due to a combination of drug-drug interactions and increased, increased QT intervals. So, uh, the much hype uh, or fake news about hydroxychloroquine has not been substantiated in clinical trials yet. And we'll wait for more robust controlled trials. Uh, I mentioned lopinavir, which is in the bottom central of this. Antiretroviral drug used for HIV. Uh, no proof that that's of uh, assistance. In, in fact, there was a negative trial. Ribavirin is being looked at also. There's uh, studies using lambda interferon, but I am gonna focus on remdesivir in a few moments because that is our major study that has been published that has shown clinical benefit. Top central is toclizumab, serolilumab, and there's some other drugs in the same space, anti-inflammatory space. These have been focused on IL-6 receptors in an inpatient setting in patients with moderate to severe pulmonary disease and inflammatory syndrome. Uh, there has been uh, evidence in case series of clinical benefit. A little bit more uh, for reference on ACE and ARBs uh, for hypertension tied to lower death risk with COVID-19. This will give you some references on where to look for that data. Negative trial for lopinavir and ritonavir in ho adults hospitalized with severe COVID-19 uh, was published in New England Journal of Medicine. This is data on toclizumab. Uh, they're treated according to protocol, but in that patients were also being treated with lopinavir, methylprednisolone. It's a small study, uh, a little bit uh, messy, uh, but a large number of these patients were either on oxygen, high flow, nasal cannula, or invasive ventilation. In that study, there was an improvement in lymphocyte count. In the lower left corner, you can see that the days of oxygen requirement were being decreased and uh, the SO2 uh, saturation was increased over day zero to day five using this medication, uh, supporting an anti-inflammatory effect and improve oxygenation. Chloroquine, you've already heard the modeling about why this should work, but we have no data for chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine in uh, randomized controlled clinical trials that show a benefit. And indeed, there was a VA study that showed an increased mortality rate risk with a uh, risk ratio of 2.6. Uh, again, extreme caution should be used when using these medications due to cardiac effects. There was also a man in Arizona who overdosed on chloroquine, uh, self-administering that medication at home. Fatal heart complications were published first in New York Times. This is a study in Brazil. There's more data on this study that's in the larger slide set that you can take a look at. Hydroxychloroquine, and we talked about a high dose versus low dose, increased mortality. There's 60% mortality in five patients with cardiac disease. Patients with SARS-CoV-2 often have cardiac disease as a direct effect of the infection. I mentioned that earlier because of the probable hypercoagulable state and uh, cardiac injury due to the systemic uh, inflammatory response. Some of these patients baseline had a prolonged QTC and then increased uh, during medication administration. The only thing that did, was shown that was positive was decreased viral shedding at day four and 22% of these patients were um, RNA negative um, at day four. So there may be an antiviral effect, but no clinical proven benefit to the patient. So we must always balance risk and benefit. Um, <clears throat> 
This is an interesting study using very, very high dose famotidine and hydroxychloroquine versus hydroxychloroquine alone. Uh, there's uh, hints that the H2 receptor antagonists may change viral uptake and viral replication. They're trying to enroll over a thousand patients, so keep your eyes open. But as we say, don't try this at home. Uh, this should be only be done in clinical trials and needs to be proven both in uh, animal models or um, in vitro, as well as a clinical benefit for patients. High dose famotidine, not proven, but being studied. You already saw this slide about IVIG potentially being uh, 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 blocking viral uh, uptake. And this is a, looking at a combination of low molecular weight heparin. This is gonna again take a prospective study and find out which uh, may be dominant in this situation, which may be helping the patient or if combination therapy is useful. This convalescent plasma theory, we have yet to prove that people actually have a uh, neutralizing antibodies and this neutralizing antibody can actually prevent reinfection or maybe a signal of immune clearance. But we are getting hints from case series that by using this convalescent or hyperimmune plasma that we can modulate the disease and decrease time in hospital oxygen requirements this was used in SARS, MERS, and also in the 2009 H1N1. Uh, we do believe that there are neutralizing antibodies to two uh, of these uh, infections with the coronavirus and to the uh, influenza virus. And the H1N1, there was a reduction in viral load and cytokine burden with these convalescent plasmas. So there's big studies going on with this right now, as well as case series. This is 10 patients with severe COVID-19. Three out of 10 were mechanically ventilated. Uh, There's transfusion that took place, but very messy study because patients were being treated with remdesivir, arbital, uh, ribavirin, paramavir, and methylprednisolone. Another study with five patients with critical COVID-19 mechanically ventilated, also in a variety of other potential antiviral or anti-inflammatory medications. But this is what was interesting, that these patients all demonstrated improvement in clinical parameters. 50% of mechanically ventilated patients uh, were uh, extubated, so there's at least a hint. And there were some interesting cytokine profiles and inflammatory uh, profiles that were uh, improved. Uh, no adverse safety events were reported, but this is quite expensive. You have to hunt down these patients, bring them into a plasma, extraction center, and then deliver the plasma to patients in a timely manner. And again, we don't have controlled studies, but there are hints from these case series that there may be a benefit. Let's switch now to this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase inhibitors. Remdesivir is the lead compound here and has been given an emergency approval by the US FDA. Favipiravir is being uh, developed by Fujifilm, and there are studies that are ongoing with that medication, but we haven't seen any either press releases or pre-publications or publications to know about favipiravir uh, at this time. Uh, uh, remdesivir was originally developed by Gilead Sciences to combat Ebola, but did not have significant benefit clinically, so that was a failure, but they did have in vitro uh, work and I believe also some animal data to suggest that it would be working against the different coronaviruses. And then that was accelerated development that you've seen with a series of publications, including one, uh, actually three now, if there was a case series of compassionate use, there was a negative study from China, but that was under-enrolled and I'm gonna say discounted. And also the uh, NIH study that was published we'll talk about in more detail. Uh, this was the report that came out of um, the first New, New England Journal of, um, of Compassionate Use showing baseline oxygen support and clinical improvement, uh, marked improvement even in invasive procedures at four weeks or less. That's in the left, left group. The right group showing there is a gradient. So the um, patients with higher age had less clinical improvement with remdesivir I think there was a lot of information in this paper that gave the green light for uh, Gilead to continue their major drug development that was here. This is what's called the simple study, or phase three randomized open label multi-center in multiple countries with a high prevalence. A primary endpoint was a clinical status by the WHO seven point ordinal scale on day 14. One of the key things here was deciding if you needed a five-day or 10-day course uh, of this uh, medication, 
as you know, there was no difference between five and 10 days. So five days will be the standard as uh, these studies are uh, moving forward. Or the efficacy results in the simple study, <clears throat> patients receiving 10 day course achieve similar results to five day course. So that was very important information here. The statistics, time to clinical improvement for 50% of patients was 10 days in the five day treatment group, 11 days in the 10 day treatment group. More than half the patients were discharged from the hospital by day 14. Clinical recovery at day 14, 64 patients in the five day treatment group. Patients received remdesivir within 10 days of symptom onset. So this is the whole idea about Early treatment uh, did better than those with greater than 10 days of symptom onset. And this is your gradient here of 62% versus 49%. The uh, overall mortality rate at day 14 outside of Italy was 7% across both treatment groups. So this is a very low mortality rate, also implying um, uh, better outcomes and treatment efficacy. So five day better are equivalent to 10 days. So this actually saves a uh, drug for initial patients. Uh, many patients discharged from the hospital by day 14. Uh, earlier uh, clinical or symptom onset tended to improve uh, clinical outcomes. No new safety signals. There is um, uh, in some set, subset of patients elevated liver enzymes, but rarely abnormal liver function. So rare bilirubin elevation. Remdesivir is renally cleared, and in this study, you had to have a GFR, I believe, of 50 or greater to get into that clinical trial. Let's look at the NIH um, data, and this is the key points from this. Uh, left side is a primary endpoint to time recovery. In the placebo group, 15 days. In the remdesivir treatment, 11 days. And the mortality rate, which just about reached clinical significance at 0 0.59, 11.6 versus 8%. Uh, percent. So lower mortality rate with a strong trend, if not reaching clinical significance. This led to uh, Gilead uh, now giving uh, this medication to uh, governments uh, throughout the world um, and having those being distributed uh, appropriately to patients in need, hospitals and centers in need. So an independent data and safety monitoring board overseeing the trial that they felt remdesivir was better than placebo. He also heard words from Anthony Fauci and other individuals about these positive results. 31% faster time to recovery. And they were cautious suggesting a survival benefit, but I think uh, reaching nearly clinical significance. Uh, there's a number of other clinical trials that are ongoing. And what uh, Gilead announced is that they're giving away this medication globally, no charge to accelerate getting this into patients' hands. I imagine someday they'll eventually start charging for this medicine, but not in the, not in the near term. There's a really good document by the IDSA. I'm not gonna go through this document, but it's very cautious about these different medications, basically talking about everything being in clinical trials. Corticosteroids, again, are being used uh, occasionally in patients, but our general feeling is this may make the, the uh, patients worse and um, no clinical data that steroids actually help patients. So be very, very cautious about steroid use. Uh, we've commented on most of the other medications uh, in this. Lopinavir, ritonavir uh, is basically gone from workup. Hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, uh, only in uh, very well-controlled clinical trials and close cardiac monitoring. I'm going to say the data I've seen today has not shown a clinically uh, significant benefit, although I did mention decreased viral shedding. There's a lot of drug-drug interactions we have to be watching for. Fevipiravir, I'm hoping that data will be available in the next uh, two to four weeks and may catch up in terms of data output to remdesivir. May be interesting to consider a combination of two drugs that directly inhibit this virus. Convalescent plasma, we need more data, but there's a suggestion of a clinical benefit. We talked about immunosuppressed and transplant patients you need to monitor for liver test elevations look for other causes, do liver biopsies in appropriate individuals, no need to reduce immune suppression except in moderate to severely ill uh, patients with COVID-19. Vaccines are next big move. There's, I think, six vaccines already in humans. There's 30 vaccines in development. There's a huge amount of investment being made both intellectually and financially in developing a vaccine. 
this is the best way for us to eventually abrogate this disease. Herd immunity will take five to seven years to infect 70 plus percent of the world population. And that's a, another bit of fake news that had been put out by Boris Johnson uh, that herd immunity is our way out of this disease. That has definitely been proven wrong. So it's social isolation, social distancing, uh, masks, hand washing, and uh, tight control of disease, as well as um, disease tracking uh, individuals, um, sequestration and quarantine methods until we have a vaccine and better immediate treatments for our patients. There are hints that there will be a coronavirus available by September, but what does available mean? Well, it probably means in phase two clinical trials, the fastest vaccine development in the history of the world was the mumps vaccine that took four years to go from uh, early development to broad-based clinical use. I know we can do better now with technology, but I'll be surprised if we have a vaccine that's available for global use uh, in less than a year. Everything needs to go right, so big pharma needs to be working with small pharma. The governments need to be working with each other. George Bush made a very uh, powerful statement last week about setting aside political divisions and working in a collaborative fashion. I think this is true news that we all need to be thinking about. This just gives you some information on favipiravir, uh, where this information was published. Um, <clears throat> a little bit more information on another uh, medication that could be used, neurokinin-1 antagonist to treat lung injury uh, in development at this time. And a final slide just talking about where treatments and vaccines and research pipelines are taking place. We don't really have any significant data on cell-based therapies, but there is some research on stem cells as well. And again, going back to the beginning, scanning, scanning current compounds for possible repurposing. Thank you for having me. I hope we finished in a timely manner. Uh, it was great to be working with you, uh, Grace, Anil, Sanjaya, and I look forward to questions. Uh, in fact, we do have a lot of questions from our chat box. Uh, just that the time is a bit running out, but probably I would just select some key questions to our speakers. First, may I ask one question to Professor Aurora uh, about some immunity? Uh, some of our graduates want to know: Is there any cross immunity between various uh, coronaviruses? There is yeah. a cross reaction. Uh, cross, so what is the cross immunity. Cross. So okay. one patient get one rather heart infection like SARS immunity. many years yes. ago, would he or she be protected from like COVID-19 now? No, no. Hmm. The answer is no. The we, we do not have a data from SARS CoV-2 virus infection because the infection has just oh. arrived over the last six months. But there is some data to suggest from the first coronavirus infection, which came in 2002 from China, that is SARS-CoV-1, in, in which it has been seen the neutralizing type of antibodies against the spike protein can be positive in the blood for as long as four years. But there is no way that because of the mutations and the different homology of the viral genome between CoV-1 and CoV-2, it's very unlikely there will be cross reactivity. In fact, the closest the gene matches in uh, in, in different uh, places and different uh, uh, species is with the pangolin virus. In fact, 99% of the pangolin virus matches the SARS-CoV-2 virus infection, whereas only 68% of the CoV-1 matches uh, CoV-2. MERS has only 58% homology equivalence. So very unlikely that there will be cross protective. Right, uh, I see. And in fact, recently I learned from the news that some people are planning some COVID-19 party, which means some people, they not get infected, but they invite some infected pa patients uh, to play together and then want to get some um, some new, uh, some natural immunity. So what's your view on this part? <laughs> Yeah, you see, if you see the way I described you the pathogenesis, there are three types of responses which can be elicited once the virus enters the body. One is a delayed interferon response followed by an exaggerated immune response when the virus comes out of the infected cells into the surrounding tissue. 
so if one does not have an exaggerated immune response and instead the acquired immunity leads to development of cytotoxic t cells then in that bargain you kill the virus and also produce helper cells to produce immunity so you know, never know which type of immune response you are going to get if one of us can find out oh this is the type of immune response you are going to generate i'll be a part of that uh, party in which i know that i will have only cytotoxic t cell response not pro inflammatory yeah. response you cannot take the risk i think it is few right. times that's party true like that's this. very true so one uh, very new questions about if a patient recover from the covid we think that this person will be kind of immune from another covid infections or uh, is the immunity can it last for long Yes. You see, the, again, we do not have data from CO2 infection. We do have a data from CO1 infection. There are a small number of the patients who have been followed up for a long period of time and up to four years, protective, neutralizing IgG antibodies are known to be present. We okay. do not have a data in CO2. But the problem is, you must understand, virus is smarter than most of us. So even if you have antibodies which are neutralizing for a particular virus, even if there is a 5% mutation, it will switch on your antibody to have a better way of surviving than we as yeah, that's true okay thank you so much professor aurora maybe i will move on to ask uh, questions to professor sanjaya thank you so uh in fact there's also a lot of interest about the line of gi and uh liver manifestation and in particular some patient will be very interested to know uh is there some time point that if a patient really have very bad uh like liver injury very bad liver derangement I'm not a liver test. Would you think there's some scenario you will need a liver biopsy to help your clinical management? Um, the answer is no, because uh, there is no case so far reported uh, in patients with uh, SARS coronavirus infection who, uh, um, who is specifically related to liver injury and death. Uh, the, the, the death uh, mortality has been reported related to the respiratory illness, not primary acute liver failure. Uh, even in the two cases that we reported, uh, one um, who developed severe liver injury uh, without significant respiratory symptoms when he, pre he presented, uh, recovered. Um, and the other one with an acute and chronic liver failure that we presented uh, also recovered. Uh, at this time, we are actually looking into a very large database in our center. Um, uh, over 300 patients with chronic liver disease. Uh, of them, about um, uh, close to near 100 patients have cirrhosis, and we are looking for acute and chronic liver failure in these groups. I won't be able to share the actual results, but my uh, preliminary um, analysis shows that the patient who does have acute chronic liver failure portends to have a worse outcome. Uh, but we're going to get these results more uh, as uh, we analyze it, so I will be able to say are better. So, so question um, with regards to your question, whether we need a liver biopsy, um, you know, the only uh, studies that mm -hmm. has shown with the liver biopsy, they showed some microvesicular steatosis. Uh, there was nothing pathognomic of the COVID-19 so far. So, I don't think we should recommend liver biopsy mm -hmm. unless uh, we are looking to rule out other causes of liver disease. And there is a confusion in terms of the diagnosis, especially when I'm saying high alkaline phosphatase level, ALT is significantly elevated, bilirubin is very high, and that's not fitting into uh, a diagnosis of COVID-19, especially when don't have a severe inflammatory response uh, syndrome, then you might consider ruling out right, other that's causes. Thank you. And about the GI manifestation, because some, uh, some experts may believe that patients with more prominent GI symptoms like diarrhea, they may have, have more viral shedding from the stool, and probably they would be more infectious to the others. So what's your view on that? Would you think that Patients with diarrhea should would be more infectious and should have a uh, more stringent isolation. Um, actually, uh, the the data in regards to the um, uh, infectivity of the stool samples uh, is not strong. Mm -hmm. What they have found, yes, mm -hmm. there is a viral setting. They may have a prolonged viral setting, but those of particles, those, um, the, the stool vi uh, viral RNA has not been shown really to be infective yet. So uh, it is not recommend. It, it, so we know that they have a longer viral setting in the stool, but whether that would cause um, them to be quarantined longer, we don't know. I don't think that has been substantiated yet that 
uh, the stool setting of viral RNA uh, is likely a source of infection. But AGA a rapid review recently they published, they have been looking for more data. Right, with that's true, this. yes. So I think okay, we in need I would like to thank Professor Sanjay for your expert uh, opinion on that. Now may I move on to ask uh, Professor Gish a few more other questions that in fact, uh, I think we are all very are really excited and looking forward to new treatment. So, so far, I would say that probably seems that remdesivir is quite promising, but probably reserved for patients with more severe disease. Would you anticipate at the end of the day, the treatment would be a combination treatment because uh, the effect size of remdesivir is not that huge, may benefit some patients. So, would you think at the end we should combine a few drugs together? Yes, and I think there's two points, uh, Grace, to think about, which is earlier intervention. So what happens if a patient becomes hospitalized following O2 sat, that's the best time to start remdesivir therapy. And I think that's what will happen as global supply chains increase rapidly. Uh, Gilead's taken their entire pharma development corporate structure and pointed this aircraft carrier towards this uh, one enemy. And I think a lot more will be available in early institution. We might be able to get by with even shorter uh, treatment, even less than five days. I hope they look at that eventually. This is a very difficult virus. I think it's going to take combination therapy to really abrogate this disease. Uh, and it may be uh, um, an uptake inhibitor uh, combined with an RNA polymerase inhibitor. And the same thing with vaccines. It may take uh, multiple uh, vaccines with multiple targets to bring about a uh, long-standing immune response, which I think may be signaled by IgA. I think the IgM and IgG uh, may be a signal of infection, but IgA may ultimately be protective. You heard briefly from Dr. Aurora about potentially an intranasal vaccine or inhaled vaccine. That may be a way to deliver right, protection right. Yeah, to fact, where the site of entry some parts of the world, like is. even in Hong Kong, we still use combination therapy like we use in the theron data. Combine, uh, in fact, we combine with Calitra, but uh, now some studies say that it's not that effective. We think that we may also combine in the theron beta with like, for example, Rambasavir or other antiviral drugs. Do you think that we have to do yeah, that's a great question. There's a large number of lambda interferon studies that are ongoing. There's some very interesting in vitro data and animal studies with lambda interferon. Uh, so Iger is working with investigators around the world to look at yeah. lambda alone. And I think they have some studies with right, combination therapy. And also so, you yes, touched on vaccination. So even you pointed out that usually we take a few years, three to four years to have that. But if you think we are very, being very optimistic, we think that the vaccine may be available like by early next year. Do you think this is possible? Yeah, my prediction right now is early 2021, mm -hmm. broad-based vaccination will be available, but balancing risk and benefits will be very important. As you recall, they were developing a vaccine for MERS and I believe also one for SARS. There is an important lesson that Dr. Aurora may remember from dengue virus uh, vaccine development, another RNA virus, that they actually got a hyperimmune response and it stopped vaccine development for dengue. So we have to be worried about vaccinating people. They get infected and then we accelerate or cause worse disease by the vaccine priming. Uh, a lot needs to be yeah, looked at true. for safety and yeah. balance. In fact, um, I, I really enjoy all the talks and also all the discussion, but uh, time is running late. And in fact, I, I really appreciate our American speaker really get up early to help us to deliver their wonderful talks. Uh, by now, I would like to conclude our sessions and I would... Uh, I, I'm sure that all of you will enjoy the talks as well as the Q&A Q session. In fact, uh, this uh, 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 this session has been uh, uh, videotaped and they will also put on their website so maybe later on you can also revisit that as well as to share with your colleagues and friends who uh, cannot make it uh, this evening so in fact i would like to uh, say goodbye to everyone once again thanks our uh, excellent speakers and and i also wish you a good day uh, and hopefully we can see each other in person maybe later this year or next year that in some other uh, meetings so with that, I would like to thank all of you. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wong. Thanks, everybody.